In Module 7, Warren and will discuss the concept of virtualization and how it relates to cybersecurity. You'll access several SANS Institute resources. SANS is the most trusted and by far the largest source for information security training and security certification in the world. SANS develops, maintains, and makes available at no cost the largest collection of research documents on every aspect of information security. As if that weren't enough, SANS operates the Internet Storm Center, which is considered the Internet's early warning system. Let's find out some more. In this video, you will learn to describe the benefits of virtualization and how a virtualized environment differs from a traditional environment, describe the role of the hypervisor in a virtualized environment, and describe the role of the virtual machine in a virtualized environment. Today, we're going to talk about some key concepts regarding virtualization. Uh, virtualization allows you to create multiple simulated environments that are dedicated resources from a single physical hardware system. Uh, on the image on your, your right side of the screen, you could see two uh, infrastructures. The one on the left is a traditional infrastructure where you have your hardware, which is uh, the little purple uh, on, on the bottom box. And on top of that, you have the operating system. And on top of that, you have your applications. On the right side of the uh, image, you will see a virtual architecture where you have your hardware on the bottom. On top of that, you have your virtualization layer. This could be a software. And on top of that, you have your OS and the application for every single virtual machine. So in this case, every single square that you have OS and app on top I will represent a virtual uh, machine. For this virtualization layer, you have the hypervisor, also called the host, which is um, the host will be the machine that has the hypervisor installed on. The hypervisor is the software or the application that runs on the, on the actual hardware that allows you to virtualize uh, operating systems. And then you have the virtual machines, also called the guest machine. And it's basically anything you, that you virtualize on top of the hypervisor or the virtualization layer. The hypervisor separates the physical resources from the, the virtual environment, meaning the virtual machines do not have direct access to the hardware itself. The hypervisor, hypervisor sits on top of the operating system as an end user, meaning you could install uh, application like VirtualBox, for example, or VMware, or you could also install it directly on hardware. This is also called the enterprise mode, and a perfect example for this is the VMware ESX, for example. Uh, on your right side of your screen, you have an image uh, where you have your hardware on the bottom, you have the hypervisor, the hypervisor on the middle, and you have your virtual machines on top of that. Finally, you have your virtual machines. It's basically a, a single data file. It's just like any digital file. It can be moved from one computer to another. You can create a virtual machine in one computer, copy that file, put it in another uh, hypervisor of the same type, and then it should run exactly the same. The hypervisor relays all the requests from the virtual machines onto the hardware itself. So uh, virtual machines do not interact directly on, uh, with the hardware. And they have a layer in between called the, like we have discussed, it's also called hypervisor. And uh, the, physical, the physical hardware is assigned directly to the VMs, but it, it is uh, done through the hypervisor. So you have uh, your RAM, you have your disk, you allocate pieces of that RAM, and you allocate that to uh, different virtual machines. So for example, if you have a total of eight gigs of RAM, you could allocate one gig to every single virtual machines that you have uh, or you're planning to install. On the right side of the screen, you have the same picture, but now you, we're talking about the upper layer, which are the virtual machines that sit on top of the hypervisor. In this video, you will learn to describe moving beyond virtualization to a cloud environment and describe the steps to deployment in a cloud environment. Welcome. I'm going to talk to you about an, over, an overview of key security tools, uh, particularly about virtualization and cloud. So how is it that we jumped from having virtualized environments to this whole cloud systems? We need to talk about first what virtualization is. 
So virtualization allows you to run software resources with less physical resources. So for example, you can have a server, a physical server, that is running different virtual machines within that server. So that makes you have different environments within or uh, running just a few physical resources. Now, what if we put together several virtualized resources, right? That's one of the questions that people asked a few years ago when this whole uh, cloud thing started. So you jump from a virtualization management, uh, then the whole service delivery automation needed to happen. Um, that aligned to business service catalogs, right? You cannot build a virtualized environment without knowing what you're going to use it for, right? So once you have that business goal you want to achieve, then you can implement this this uh, model into into your business needs or to fulfill your business needs. Then uh, you, we had an end-to-end real-time monitoring and optimization, and consumption-based mattering and dynamic capacity optimization, right? So this is just a, a, a chart that tells us how is it that we jump from those virtualized uh, environments to have this whole cloud environment, right? We, we jumped from having single resources and single virtualized resources to have a whole level of, of interacting uh, devices fulfilling a service need. Now let's talk about a cloud de uh, deployment and how it looks like, right? And in, in the previous slide, we talk about how we jump from having just virtualized environments to a whole cloud uh, providing services. Now, in order to uh, to understand how a cloud deployment looks like, and, and you can guide yourself with this chart and the slide, you have uh, three steps you need to follow, right? And several interim steps within those within those steps, right? So you need to first to consolidate the operations you have. And with, with consolidation, we mean uh, what is it that you want to move to the cloud, right? What is it that you want to serve and what services you need there? Then you need to virtualize the, that list of items that you did in step one. You need to virtualize those. Then you need to have resources to do the whole virtualization. On uh, step two, you need to automate that, right? Um, by automation, we we mean like the services and the, and the items you're going to use to manage those items you consolidate in step one. Once you have all the structure and how you're going to manage this, then you're going to start moving to the cloud. And within the cloud, you're going to integrate and optimize it because you need to measure how it's how it's behaving and how it's performing. You need to make sure that uh, the business needs are integrated to uh, the cloud and that the services you're providing actually are fulfilling what you want for the business. And of course, uh, the optimization, uh, you need to make sure that the resources that you have in place are uh, actually uh, working for what you want, right? You don't want to have, if what you want is just a, an email, a cloud email solution, then you don't need a hundred servers. You know, you don't need to have it co-located in different places, right? And this point is where you you, you need to give it some size. You need to do some uh, sizing exercise, so you can optimize your resource and understand if what you have currently and what you've built currently, it's enough, or if you at, at the future will need more resources to keep growing. And this is something you will only know by knowing your business and to know uh, what is it that you want to achieve with with cloud computing. In this video, you will learn to define cloud computing and cloud computing models. Now we're going to talk about what is cloud computing. We talk about how we end up from just virtualization to have uh, entire cloud environments. But what is it a cloud, a cloud computing? Cloud computing is an on-demand availability of system resources, right? So this means that you will have an environment that has virtualized uh, devices that will serve a business purpose, right? And this could be anywhere from storage up to computing power. And the chart you have on your screen, you will see some of the uh, positives and negatives of cloud computing. Now I have to say that some of the negatives 
are just perceptions, right? Um, there are facts that could contradict this, but anyways. Um, so let's go into the plus side. So you have choice and, and agility of business, right? Since you have um, several virtualized resources, you have flexibility, you can grow in any place around the world, you have integration, that's what it means. Uh, you have a scale and cost. So uh, as, you want, as you may think, having virtualized resources sometimes is cheaper than having boxes for each individual server or, or service you want to deliver. And obviously this allows us to scale the business as we need. Uh, since we don't need to add um, hardware to the solution, we can uh, pay our provider to have more resources as we're, uh, as we're growing. Um, then we have a encapsulated change management. So this means that uh, the whole management of the system, regardless of how big or how small it is, we can have the single place where we can manage everything. We don't need to be on site in India in one day, and we don't need to be on site in the United States in the other day to be able to manage it. There should be a, a, a single point or single place where you can manage all the environment. And of course, uh, as technology moves on, cloud moves on as well, that means that we will have next generation architecture. Every new single technology out there that will be implemented in clouds and will make it more effective and more efficient, uh, providers usually apply those technologies to the service, making it better day to day. Now, let's talk to the negatives, right? So there's a perception out there that since you're sharing resources with other people, uh, security gets compromised, right? And, and, and this is not true, but I can see how that perception can, can fly, right? So for example, you have, uh, let's talk about an email uh, service, right? Uh, let's talk about Gmail, for example. So you have different accounts sh uh, or hosted within the same physical resources or the same cloud environment, right? So there are countermeasures and there are things and elements that you need to consider for cloud computing that usually those big companies and, and providers uh, give us. We will cover that a, a little bit uh, later in this session, but it is in fact a perception that security could, could be not that proper within a cloud computing environment. Now the other thing is a lock-in, and this is actually true. By lock-in we mean that if you have a provider and you, if you have a a whole service based in the cloud and you hired a, a, a cloud provider to do this, usually that takes a lot of work, right? So this means that if this provider uh, out of the blue decides to uprise their fees or the fees that you're paying, it might be hard to move away from that provider depending on how much services you have and how much time you have invested. So this could be a drawback for, for cloud computing. Of course, if this is properly planned, you can do some um, maintenance and, and movements to be able to move provider, right? It's not that you cannot do that, but definitely it, it requires some work. Now, um, lack of control, lack of control. So this uh, means that people have the perception that probably since you don't have the devices on site, you're not really controlling them. It's proven that's not the case, right? You, even though you hire the service you still have control now depending on the service that you have and this is something that we will cover later on you you might not be responsible of doing patching activities for example or, or provide maintenance to the devices because you're not managing them so uh, you could have lack of control for sure and also the reliability and we we, we go back to the same point as you don't have control of the devices how can i rely on something that i don't control but it is part of the of the service and of the cloud computing environment. Now let's talk about the different cloud computer types that you can have out there. So the first one being the public cloud. So a public cloud is the most common uh, type of cloud computing you can find out there. Uh, pretty much, you own and up it's owned and operated by a third party. So you don't need to, to do pretty much anything other than provide the instructions and how do you want to manage it. Uh, you share hardware and processing resources with other organizations. This is usually called a tenant. So this means that there's a group of physical 
resources that is assigned to serve different customers so you can be sharing those resources with another company that's um, what it's called a public a public cloud of course you don't need to purchase anything of everything is provided by by the um, by the carrier which that, that used to lower the cost uh, you don't need to provide maintenance you can scale the environment as much as you like and it is very reliable hence being one of the most common uh, options for for companies now let's talk about the other uh, type or the second type which is a private cloud and and this comes when you're talking about security right um, what if I don't really want to share those resources with another company right so this is the this is the this is going to be the option for you so on private cloud you don't share resources you have the dedicated resources for your cloud so this means that you're not going to be part of a tenant anymore but you're going to have dedicated resources. This allows you for more flexibility to meet, to meet specific business needs, right? So if you uh, if there's a portion of your business that is critical that you you don't really want to 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 have the risk of sharing uh, physical resources with other organizations, you can have or you can achieve this by having a private cloud. And this allows you also uh, more security because you will have higher level of controls, meaning that, again, you won't share uh, anything with anyone. So you could have a bit more of control of what you have on, on your private cloud. Now, and as you will think, the, the third option is going to be a hybrid cloud, where you're pretty much going to have the best of both worlds, right? You can control your private infrastructure for sensitive assets. Uh, it's kind of cost effective because obviously it's going to be cheaper to grow in the public side than in the private side because private is going to are going to be resources dedicated to you and they're going to be expensive right so if you uh, on a hybrid cloud option you could grow if you have a portion of your business that is going to grow you can make it grow in the public side or in the public cloud and that is going to be cheaper than than growing the whole private thing so it, it can get cost effective there now let's talk about the cloud computing reference model. This is just um, an abstract chart that describes the functions of a cloud computing environment. It, it's just a reference to understand how uh, the cloud computing works. Right on your left, you have the consumer, which will be the person uh, hiring the service or implementing the service. Um, the security side is, is managed by a figure of a cloud auditor, right? It is, is going to make sure that the security is the proper one, that the privacy is there, and, and of course, doing control audits to make sure that the information is, is reliable and it is in good hands. The big box in the middle is the cloud provider, which will provide different service, services, which uh, might be software as a service, uh, platform as a service and infrastructure as a service. We will cover this in the next slide. And at the right, you have the cloud broker, which is the people who are in a way reselling the services of the cloud to uh, to the, con the cloud consumer. And at the bottom, you can see the cloud carrier, which is the organization who is actually managing the cloud and uh, doing patching of the systems and maintaining everything in order for the service to be to be effective. Now let's talk about the models of cloud computing, and this is you probably have seen this in in different places, right? So first we have the software as a service. So the software as a service is a third-party hosting an application and makes it available on the internet, right? You can have Salesforce, Google Apps, Facebook. You have mail services like Hotmail and Gmail. It's pretty much the most common use of a cloud computing. Uh, service, which is a software as a service. You, there's a lot of software as a service applications out there, anywhere from web applications that you can find on the internet to to do charts or to do graphic on on pictures and and file editing and a lot of information about software as a service. So, what I wanted to take away with this is that software as a service is 
based on the cloud and is the fact that you can use an application, an actual application that you could get benefit from online, right? You don't need it in your computer. You don't need to install anything. You can just, it is house, host out there and you can use it. Then we have the platform as a service. And as you may uh, infer here, you're actually getting your own platform. You're not getting any more an application, but it's a whole platform that allows you to develop or run or manage applications without the complexity of maintaining your own infrastructure. Right? You, you don't need to have your infrastructure there. So you, you will purchase from a vendor the environment where you will run your your tasks, right? This could be from middleware, from a database um, environment, a Java sandbox where you can develop applications, where you can have developers working in there. You don't really need to have the whole platform to do that, but you will purchase that from a vendor that will give you that service. That's the whole um, spirit of the platform as a service. Then last but not least, you will have infrastructure as a service, which delivers a whole computer infrastructure anywhere from storage servers, network divides, et cetera, right? You can have a whole data center uh, as a service, and this will be your infrastructure. If you don't want to purchase network devices, if you don't want to have routers or switches, you don't want to, if you don't have space for them, you could actually get those in an infrastructure as a service model where you can purchase the uh, the the right to use or the, the the networking device and you could use it remotely and it will serve all of your needs but you don't have the actual device in there. In this video you will learn to describe the benefits of cloud computing, describe the components of cloud security, and define the importance of a cloud governance process. Now we're going to talk about the cloud benefits, uh, a little bit about cloud security and, and the importance of have a proper governance around, uh, about your, uh, around your cloud computing environment. So what are the benefits of cloud computing based on everything that we have covered so far? So first of all, you have flexibility, right? You have the capability to grow an environment according to your business needs. You're not attached to a single place. You can have access to the resources from wherever you are in the world and you don't, you don't have limitations about it. So cloud computing, as you may guess, comes very handy and very flexible. The second one is efficiency, right? Um, the fact that you can add, you, you can join a meeting using WebEx, whatever you are and at the time, at whatever time in the world that you are, right? Uh, and the fact that you can add more resources to make uh, speeds more efficient, that's, uh, what we call efficiency in cloud computing. And of course, and the most important thing is the strategic value. The fact that the same flexibility that we talked about a few, a few seconds ago allow us to uh, guide the strategic, the strategic um, items about cloud computing with our strategic goals or on our organizational goals, right? So the fact that you can guide those in the same direction makes a lot for the strategic value of, of a business. Now let's talk about cloud security. When you have a cloud, uh, remember that in the first slides, we mentioned that one of the perceptions about cloud computing is that you don't really have security. Well, that's not true um, at 100%, right? You do have cloud security. And these are just some of the items that you have to consider when you want to establish or you want to have proper controls in terms of security around cloud. So first of all, you need to have a disaster recovery and business continuity planning in place, right? So you, you want to think about what happens if my vendor uh, is under an attack or what happens if my vendor has a power outage that can provide more services. You need to, have, you need to uh, think about in a disaster, right? So do I need to have another provider? Do I need to have a backup just in case? Do I need to have uh, copies of my backups and run books about how I did the whole implementation of the cloud in case I need to go and run, look for another, for another vendor? All of that needs to be well established and planned uh, in the disaster recovery and business continuity. Then 
governance, and we're going to talk a little bit more about governance in, in the last slide, which is the next one. But you definitely need to want to. You definitely need to have some governance around cloud computing, right? Who's going to be in charge? What parties need to be involved? What is going to be the communication plan? Uh, what are going to be the flows? What do I going? To, what I'm going to expect out of the cloud environment? All of that needs to be properly established. Uh, of course, compliance, and with compliance, we mean we mean uh, for how long, for example, I, I need to have the logs for from a, a cloud computing. Um, is that cloud computing compliant against any regulations that I might have in my organization? Right? Um, is it compliant with the policies I have in the country that that I'm based at? Right? Um, let's talk about, for example, GDPR. Right? In Europe. Uh, is that inf is my cloud computing environment compliant with GDPR? Is it going to violate any any information from my vendors of my customers uh, across the world? That's something that we need to really consider about cloud computing. Of course, availability and this ties into the disaster recovery plan as well. Um, what happens if my vendor is out of service? Do I have another vendor? Um, the information that is within the cloud. What happens if it's not if it's not available anymore? Do I have a website? Do I have a a, a server that a server on on site that can host the website that I have hosted in the cloud? All of that is information that I want to have uh, in mind when when putting my security um, framework around the cloud security. Of course, data security. Um, is the information encrypted? How is it going to how is it going to travel from my company to my cloud vendor? What uh, safeguards my cloud vendor has in place? Right, that's something really important. We want to make sure we have um, uh, periodic audits in our cloud uh, or within our cloud provider to make sure that our data is uh, is safe out there. Specific, particularly if we have that, or if we have an infrastructure based on a public cloud. And something really, really important is the identity and access management. We want to make sure and we want to have a record of who is accessing what, where, how, and why, right? That's really important. We need to make sure that access management is a must. The fact that we have um, a third party managing the cloud environment doesn't mean that we still need to track and need to have access to, to those logs and visibility to those logs. So, all of this item we, all of these items we just talk about in conjunction made for a good cloud security strategy now let's talk about cloud governance and this is going to finish the the, the cloud security um, portion of of the slides in order to have a cloud an effective cloud strategy you need to have a very good cloud governance and the only way you need to you can have a good governance around cloud is that this governance is aligned with the service and with the organization, which is the little uh, circles you see on your right side. And as you see there, the three of them, the governance, the service, and the organization need to overlap in different places, right? You cannot have governance if it's not um, aligned to your service or the service you're providing in the cloud. And of course, the service you're providing in the cloud needs to be aligned with the organization goals, right? And the organization goals, of course, need to have or need to be involved with the governance. So as you see, it's a little triangle. You cannot really sacrifice any of the points in the triangle. All the three need to be there and need to be aligned, as I said, with the service, with the organization, with the governance in order to have an effective cloud security strategy. Welcome to Introduction to Containers. After watching this video, you will be able to identify the traditional computing issues for software development, define a container and describe its characteristics, and list container benefits and challenges and popular container vendors. Cloud Native is the newest application development approach for building scalable, dynamic, hybrid cloud-friendly software, and container technology is a powerful part of that approach. Let's check out the analogy of a shipping container. 
The modern shipping industry standardized a set of container sizes, so no matter what item is shipped, the container size remains the same. Standardization significantly improves shipping efficiency. Logistics staff select container transport options, such as ships, planes, trains, and trucks, based on the container size and the client's delivery needs. Digital container technology is similar. Containers solve the problem of making software portable so that the applications can run on multiple platforms. A container powered by the containerization engine is a standard unit of software that encapsulates the application code, runtime, system tools, system libraries, and settings necessary for programs to build, ship, and run applications efficiently. Operations and underlying infrastructure issues are no longer blockers. You can quickly move applications from your laptop to a testing environment, from a staging environment to a production environment, from a physical machine to a virtual machine, or a private cloud or public cloud, and always know that your application will work correctly. A container can be small, just tens of megabytes, and developers can almost instantly start containerized applications. With these capabilities, containers serve as the foundation for today's development and deployment solutions standards. Let's examine some of the development and deployment challenges organizations encounter with traditional computing environments. In traditional environments, developers can't isolate the app and allocate or designate specific storage and memory resources for apps on physical servers. Servers are often underutilized or overutilized, leading to poor utilization and a poor return on investment. Traditional deployments require comprehensive provisioning resources and expensive maintenance costs. The limits of physical servers can constrain application performance during peak workloads. Applications are not portable across multiple environments and operating systems. Implementing hardware for resiliency is often time-consuming, complex, and expensive. Traditional on-premises IT environments have limited scalability. And finally, automation is challenging when distributing software to multiple platforms and resources using traditional environments. Containers enable organizations to overcome these challenges. Container engines virtualize the operating system and are responsible for running containers. Platform-independent containers are lightweight, fast, isolated, portable, and secure, and often require less memory space. Binaries, libraries, and other entities within the container enable apps to run, and one machine can host multiple containers. Containers help programmers quickly deploy code into applications. Containers are platform-independent and can run on the cloud, desktop, and on-premises. Containers being operating system-independent run on Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. Containers are also programming language and IDE-independent, whether you are running Python, Node, Java, or other languages. Containers enable organizations to quickly create applications using automation, lower deployment time and costs, improve resource utilization, including CPU and memory, port across different environments, and support next-gen applications, including microservices. Now, using containerization is not without its challenges. Server security can become an issue if its operating system is affected. Developers can become overwhelmed when managing thousands of containers. Converting monolithic legacy applications can be a complex process, and developers can experience difficulty right-sizing containers for specific scenarios. Next, let's learn about some of the more popular container vendors. Docker is a robust platform and the most popular container platform today. Podman is a daemonless container engine that is more secure than Docker. Developers often prefer LXC for data-intensive applications and operations, and Vagrant offers the highest levels of isolation on the running physical machine. In this video, you learned that organizations are moving to containers to overcome challenges around isolation, utilization, provisioning, performance, and more. A container is a standard unit of software that encapsulates everything needed to build, ship, and run applications. 
Containers are operating system, programming language, and platform independent. They lower deployment time and costs, improve utilization, automate processes, and support next-gen applications or microservices. Developers may find that management, legacy project migration, and right-sizing are significant challenges. And finally, major container vendors include Docker, Podman, LXC, and Vagrant. Welcome to Introduction to Docker. After watching this video, you will be able to define what Docker is, describe the Docker process and underlying technology, list the benefits of Docker containers, and identify the challenges of Docker containers. Available since 2013, the official Docker definition, paraphrased, states that Docker is an open platform for developing, shipping, and running applications as containers. Docker became popular with developers because of its simple architecture, massive scalability, and portability on multiple platforms, environments, and locations. Docker isolates applications from infrastructure, including the hardware, the operating system, and the container runtime. Docker is written in the Go programming language. Docker uses Linux kernel features to deliver its functionality. Docker also uses namespaces to provide an isolated workspace called the container. And Docker creates a set of namespaces for every container and each aspect runs in a separate namespace with access limited to that namespace. Docker methodology has inspired additional innovations, including complementary tools such as Docker CLI, Docker Compose, and Prometheus, and various plugins, including storage plugins, orchestration technologies using Docker Swarm or Kubernetes, and development methodologies using microservices and serverless. Docker offers the following benefits. Docker's consistent and isolated environments result in stable application deployments. Deployments occur in seconds. Because Docker images are small and reusable, they significantly speed up the development process and Docker automation capabilities help eliminate errors, simplifying the maintenance cycle. Docker supports Agile and CI-CD DevOps practices. Docker's easy versioning speeds up testing, rollbacks, and redeployments. Docker helps segment applications for easy refresh, cleanup, and repair, and developers collaborate to resolve issues faster and scale containers when needed. And Docker images are platform independent, so they are highly portable. Docker is not a good fit for applications with these qualities. Require high performance or security. Are based on monolithic architecture. Use rich GUI features. Or perform standard desktop or limited functions. In this video, you learned that Docker is an open platform for developing, shipping, and running applications as containers. Docker speeds up the deployment process across multiple environments. Docker uses namespaces technology to provide an isolated workspace called the container. Docker creates a set of namespaces for every container, and each aspect runs in a separate namespace with access limited to that namespace. Docker supports Agile and CI-CD DevOps practices. And lastly, Docker containers are not a good fit for applications based on monolithic architecture or applications that require high performance or security. Thank you for attending this course. If you're interested in acquiring additional skills in cybersecurity, we hope to see you again.